Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Armando introduced, I'm the co-founder of Nexit Capital, a small asset management firm in Luxembourg, and I also overview the research of development of our proprietary quant strategy. Uh, as an introduction, I mean, it's really a pleasure for, her, for her, us to be here to discuss and to share about our view on Nexit Capital on this big data and machine learning revolution. I guess it doesn't come as a surprise to you if I tell you that this revolution I have pushed our quant finance industry into a new era. And we see two main reasons behind this. The first one is, is something we have talked a lot about today, which is the access to new type of data, which by the construction and essence are able to capture very complementary and additional uh, information compared to more traditional data sets, such as fundamental data, uh, analyst estimate, or, or pricing, just to name a few. And, and the second one is really this, this remarkable advance in the field of machine learning due to different reasons, uh, algorithmic breakthrough, but also the ability for small firm today to access extremely powerful computing power at very cheap cost. Now, our business has been and will continue to be greatly impacted uh, by this revolution. But we don't see it as a negative disruptor or, or as a threat, but really as an opportunity to, to revisit existing problems with different tools and perspective. And, and this is really something that we dive in today and really feel extremely excited about, actually. <clears throat> At Exit Capital, we talk about quantifying the investment process, which is the ability to systematize a more traditional, qualitative uh, investment approach. And we define that in five steps. The first one being the con context analysis. Basically understanding in, in which environment, environment we are. The second one is the forecast or signal generation. We need to capture signals for our strategies. We then have signal combination and conditioning. What do you do when you have multiple signals? How do you combine them together? Then we have, of course, the important part, which is the portfolio construction and the risk adjustment. How do you optimize your portfolio with a risk budgeting? No matter what it is, but, but you have to do it. And finally, all, of course, we can optimize trade uh, or cost control. But we see opportunities in all of those steps, thanks to the new dimensionality from alternative data and also the tools that we have now to process them. So in a way, this might seem quite ambitious, but we really see great perspective. And today, we are here to discuss about the first step, the context analysis. I guess we all have slightly different way to define what the context is all about. And, and we're not claiming that ours is better than others, but we really believe that it's capital to define it properly and to understand what we mean by it in order to assess it right. And at Nexit Capital, we define the context as a summary of the health and the propitious aspect of the environment in which evolves the financial market. So now the question is, why do we need the context, right? And this is really crucial because we believe that context allows you to define market regimes. And then, in turn, you can use them for many different purposes. We have risk uh, management, for example, strategic allocation, multi-strategy allocation, strategy enhancement, flow positioning. I mean, th there are many ways to do it. And this has been backed by many empirical studies or academic evidence, for example, like the impact of economic uh, cycle or geopolitical news on, for example, the equity market. And in itself, there is nothing completely new in trying to explain the context. People have tried to do that for a long time. But we believe that today, we should give the context, due to the new space of exploration uh, from alternative data, a much, much bigger part in our investment process. So we define the context into two main categories. The first one being the global economic climate, which aim to capture underlying driver of the context, which are basically exogenous to the market. The second one, global sentiment, where we try to capture underlying drivers of the context, which are 
endogenous to the market. And this combination of both external and internal factors is for us very important. We further sub divide our global economic climate into three classes. The first one aimed to capture what's the current geopolitical and political situation. Then we want to know what's the health of the economy. And finally, what's the current activity in terms of monetary policy. And we apply the same for our global sentiment. First of all, positioning and flow. How are investors positioned in the market? Volatility, what's the uncertainty in the market? Price and volume, what's the activity on the market? And finally, correlation dispersion, which is how the subcomponent of the market move and co-move together. And now I think this is the key step where alternative data and machine learning plays a key role. They basically help us to find more granular, uncorrelated, higher frequency, quantifiable signals that allow us to build proxies for our context indicator. So I know the slide look, looks pretty heavy, and the idea is not to go through everything, but to give you a couple of examples of those indicators. So if we look at the state of the economy, the one on the top left, and we have heard that a little bit today already, but we can access now real-time new sentiment and entity or sector of the economy. We can almost have a real-time uh, information about e-commerce trend. We have real-time uh, uh, credit card consumption trend and flows data. And we even have the ability, which is maybe one step further, to get coverage and tracking of the supermarket, for example, or shopping center traffic, thanks to satellite images. And this only became possible because of the great advance in machine learning, specifically in computer vision, image processing, natural language processing, where companies have used those techniques to do great advances, and now it's slightly starting to come to finance. So we see how alternative data have brought new kind of indicator where or which can help us to build new signals to capture underlying driver of the context. And then now I'd like to go for the next couple of slides into a little bit more detail on a few indicators that we have. And the first one was what we have heard about in the introduction, our geopolitical and political uh, indicator. Not so long time ago, it was really difficult to even imagine such indicator in a systematic way. But now we have the possibility to build it thanks to great advance, again, in natural language processing and text analysis, and the ability to really extract real-time sentiment from use, from which then we can build tailor-made indicator. And this specific indicator was built using Ravenpack data, and it shows how news can be used to build indicator that basically quantify and react to geopolitical uh, events and tension. Here we share two other indicators that we use, which are our global macro stress index and our global economy index. And they are not fundamentally new in themselves. But what's really interesting is to see how today we can enhance such kind of indicator using news data or, for example, credit card consumption. And combining that with more advanced machine learning techniques, such as unsupervised learning, we are able really to create more kind of indicator and more precise and sensible signals. So all in all, I mean, acknowledging the fact that the context is important to define market regimes in our investment process, we have shown that by defining it, we can build very complementary indicator which are able to capture underlying driver of the context. And in the second part of this presentation, I'd like to give the floor to Alex, who will share with you a case study on how we can apply context to enhance a trading strategy. Alex, the floor is yours. OK, hello from me as well. Thank you very much, Dimitri and Armando. So what I'd like to do now is to make a more practical uh, touch, to give a more practical touch to what Dimitri was explaining in the first half. And namely, um, what we would like to show you is how we approach uh, this uh, great database of, of news and new sentiment uh, by Ravenpack to describe our context and then to 
essentially enhance uh, a well-known strategy on in the investment world. So the starting point of this strategy is the time series momentum. Um, this has been well studied, documented, uh, let's say of a phenomenon or anomaly on financial markets, which essentially aims to exploit um, empirical patterns of autocorrelation across assets. Um, and essentially, the, the, the goal of, so, so on, on top of that, you build a trend-following strategy. Um, and essentially, the goal there is to invest in assets that are upward-trending and um, you know, long, and go short in assets that are downward-trending. However, the trend is defined. Um, there have been many studies uh, to, to what, what gives very good performance. Here in our benchmark, uh, the, the, the starting point of our study, we, we start with a, a very simple and well-known um, signal, which is the sign of the 12-month return. And we apply it across different asset classes, equity indices, fixed income rates, uh, commodities, and so on and so forth. Overall, I would say this is a relevant example in the sense that trend-following strategies have a sizable volume in the uh, asset management universe. Um, and here, the key point is, and this is essentially in these two points at the, at the, at the bottom, um, to understand the following, that um, the, our starting point, the, the um, trend following strategy, bases the investment decisions based on past asset returns. This means on the time series momentum solely. What we like to do now is to also include in this investment decision also the, the context analysis as well. However, not overwriting time series momentum, but keeping them both together. Um, Dimitri very, very nicely explained in the beginning that we view the investment paradigm as context, afterwards comes signal definition. So here, the time series momentum is the signal, but the context analysis comes as an overlay, an incremental enhancement of the, the investment decision. So essentially, the, the, the step that we follow here um, would be, I can summarize them in three steps. First, we have to describe and measure the context. We can do that quite well um, using uh, new sentiment and, and classical indicators. Um, and afterwards, we have to relate the context with our instruments because we want to invest in the end, taking into account what the context gives as a signal. So here I'll describe the first two, two steps in one, essentially. Um, Dimitri explained that we view the context as essentially a, a part of two groups um, or two building blocks. One is the global economic climate and the other is the global investor sentiment. Um, and both of those you can put many indicators inside. You can put more classical indicators. You can put those such coming from, from alternative data sources. Here in particular, um, we looked at carefully at how we can complement both of them using also news analytics data coming from the Rev Impact database. Um, and there, I, I think that's a, quite a benefit of, of that database is that you can express also macroeconomic indicators. It's not just linked to a new sentiment of a stock. You can think of geopolitical risk, for example. Um, and essentially, the way we, we started here is to um, say, OK, um, we, based on our own experience and based on findings in the literature, we start to construct qualitatively a big list of indicators that we would like to look at. Um, for example, um, maybe some of you know, the Ravenpack database is structured sort of, I would say, in a nested way. You have the topic, you have the group, the type, and so on, category, and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we looked at the types um, across, whenever possible, across um, different um, um, regions. Um, for example, um, um, business news, uh, economy news, and so on and so forth, but also dived into group level. So essentially, we found out that most of the, um, the, the good results that we achieved were, were by when you aggregated um, the set context indicators at the, at the group level. Um, so initially, we started with a list of about 200. Uh, we boiled it down um, by looking at where the data quality was the highest on the one hand, and on the other hand, also uh, looking at uh, simple um, um, measures, uh, I would say model-free measures of to, to, to check how does this relate, the indicators relate to the one month or one week or one step ahead forward return of the assets in, within our universe. And um, one key point here is how do you, because the, the, the daily sentiment that we extract is quite noisy, we found, so we have to aggregate it somehow. And that's, um, here we, we exploit the different aggregations at a different level. 
um, week, month, and so on and so forth. But that's, I would say, an still an open area of, 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 of research, how exactly to do it in the best way. OK, so we managed to boil down our starting point to around a third um, of what we started with. Um, and uh, together with, with more classical indicators for volatility, um, some macro data that was still released at our, uh, the time frame that we were looking at, we built this builds the set of our inputs, which would now like to relate to somehow to the instruments. And there, I mean, it's important to understand that, that also the, a lot of the indicators that we have, such as, such for example, the geopolitical risk, um, we cannot invest on that directly. There's no instrument that's called geopolitical risk that's such that I can invest on that. So here we have to somehow establish the relationship within those in, within our universe. And there we, we, we thought of two approaches. So one was to build uh, models for each individual asset. But the other one, which we like more, is to, in, because we see the context as a sort of an overlay, so it should come as a sort of a top-down approach to our systematic investment strategy, we said, no, we are going to do it by um, clusters of instruments, clusters coming from our, our um, total universe of instruments within that strategy. Um, and um, one simple way to, to cluster them is by looking at the historical correlation and also, I would say, semi-qualitatively interpreting the, the end results. Um, so we do end up with, you could say, subclasses or sub-categories sub, um, um, of, of asset classes, such as U.S. Uh, fixed income, U.S. equities, metals, and so on and so forth. And this is essentially the out, this is going to be the output in our model. Returns would here do an equally weighted average of, of, of said clusters. We do them one step ahead, and we, I'm not quite sure what happened here with the formula. It got messed up, but um, I'll just explain it. We do a, um, a classification um, um, problem, essentially. We cast it as a classification problem, in particular because the trend following strategy is one where you're always invested, so you're either long or short in all the instruments. So it makes sense to work with two classes there. And uh, essentially, you model this uh, conditional probability to go up um, as a function of the past values of our um, inputs. Um, and for me, the most interesting part is not this. The most interesting part is how do you put it all together in terms of actually relating your investment strategy with what your predictive model, however simple or complicated it might be. And, and, and this, it's, it follows quite, I, I think it's quite straightforward logic. Um, you have essentially one signal that is a time series momentum signal, the investment signal that you don't want to touch, that you want to keep, and you see whether it's concordant or discordant with the context. I mean, we can imagine a situation where the time series momentum says that I should invest in oil long. However, I have a context indicator that is geopolitical risk in oil producing countries that worsens in that period. So, it's logical for me to say, OK, um, I might still go long, but I will not go, I'm not going to put as much money as, as, as I would have done otherwise. One thing that I forgot to mention from the first slide is that our trend following is um, allocating the capital using a risk parity um, allocation, which essentially boils down to the fact that we make the um, contribution to the overall risk, risk of the different instruments to be equal. Um, this can be applied um, on, on the signal level, on the weight level directly, so I can um, essentially have this logic in, in, in terms of, of uh, underweighting, underweighting the signal, or even if I, after I run a plain vanilla uh, time series, uh, sorry, trend following strategy, I can overweight and underweight the weights that come afterwards. Um, and to summarize, the idea is to take the signal Take, see what the weight is, and afterwards decide based on the context how far you want to adapt. Um, in terms of, so we ran uh, um, several algorithms to, 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 to see this, ranging from simple ones uh, to, to a bit more advanced nonlinear techniques. Um, we don't see any dramatic difference in terms of the uh, accuracy, but we also evaluated, and of course, for us in the end, it's, what's important is the investment outcome. And um, we see that up to 20% of total return is there, thanks to um, the context, the way we describe it, on top of the benchmark, where with, a, um, I would say, similar um, risk characteristics, which doesn't come to a surprise because we have a target volatility. Um, how do the wealth curves look like? 
um, again, not surprising, they are not dramatically different. Why? Because we, when we go, because when the time series momentum predicts that we should go long, we do still go long, but we look at the context whether we should go as long, more long, or less long, depending on the outcome of the context analysis. Um, in terms of performance comparison throughout the years, uh, the results are promising in the sense that throughout the years, when we make money, we make a little bit more money. When we use the context and we lose money, we lose a little bit less money than when we use the context. So I would say that adding the context in, seems to enhance the performance on, over the backtest period. Um, there is, of course, so the first good message is that new sentiment can be used to enhance it. Um, there is, of course, a lot of, of, of areas to work on. Uh, you can work on, on your outputs, you can work on your clustering, you can work on your signals, you can work on your models. There is a multitude of, of areas to work on. That's uh, without a doubt. But at least that's already a good news. Um, and now I come to the last point of our, or last slide of our presentation, which is just to give you a summary and outlook. Um, so even one, I think one can even use alternative data sets, such as news, to enhance even existing strategies. It doesn't always have to be a strategy that comes completely new. It's already one thing that we can see and we can use. Alternative data has opened door, the doors to many more uh, additional opportunities to explore. Of course, and that's one part that I, I, I particularly strive to, and, and we at Nextgate always try to, 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 to have, is to have results that are economic and interpretable. Um, it, it is so that these, some of these alternative data sources sometimes give results which are less obvious in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, at the first look of how do they relate with, with what you expect. Um, and, but lastly, um, I would say the following, that now, after Dimitri also talked about the context, we have access to the tools and to the data to describe and measure the context a lot better than you could 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and so on. So, we should do it. We believe uh, at our company that it should be an integral part of the uh, systematic investment process. Um, with this, I conclude. And uh, thank you very much for hosting us today. Thank you for your attention. This is Raven Pack. 